Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed an honor for me to be here this morning. And I want to first of all just give a big uh, round of applause to Skills for Change Canada for inviting me here this morning. Let's give them a hand. This organization. We want to just uh, thank them for uh, allowing me, you know, and I, I saw some of my friends this morning as I walked in the room. and. Um, you know, they agreed that they would be saying amen throughout the, the presentation this morning. So but we're talking about religion here, right? We're talking about faith and the workplace. And so, and also it's good to see my friend um, Karen and Winston this morning. And I think, Rabbi, we're going to have a, a, a great uh, dialogue this morning when you have a reverend and a, and a rabbi on the same panel. It, it's just going to be uh, some good, uh, good discussion. So I'm looking forward to that. Again, thank you for this opportunity to present to you this morning, and uh, I may feel very comfortable here, so I might be in my pulpit for a couple hours. How many of you got a couple hours? Right, so we're going to be a little interactive this morning. That's just the way that I am, um, just to kind of just, you know, get you involved in, in the presentation so you're not all falling asleep. I know some of you have had your coffee already, but maybe you're not enough. But I promise it, uh, that I will be excited, hopefully, and you will, we will we'll hear something. Uh, that will spur your discussions later on this afternoon. So it's indeed an honor to address the many entrepreneurs and leaders uh, and business people in, in attendance on the subject that is close to my heart. As an entrepreneur and a pastor and an immigrant, the subject of diversity and faith in the workplace is something that is close to, close to home. Now more than ever, the world is globalized. As an increasing immigrant friend of nation since the 1960s, Canada is in a rare position in the 21st century global community. Immigration has changed over the past few decades. First, in the 1960s and 1970s, we saw an increase in European and Caribbean immigrants coming to Canada, which brought much ethnic diversity to this country. Today, with immigrants not only coming from Judeo-Christian regions like Europe and the Caribbean, but from Muslim nations like Iraq and Iran, or Hindu nations like India and Pakistan, there's a greater need for accommodations. But this time, it is as much religious as cultural, especially in the workplace. The second change, which is influential immigration policy, and Paul just made reference to that, the increase in aging population known as the baby boomers. As this segment of the population exits the workforce in droves through retirement, Experts warn us that there aren't enough students in our post-secondary institutions or workers in the workforce to fill these positions. We're being told that nations will increasingly need to compete in attracting qualified immigrants to fill this gap. And just recently heard our uh, Minister Jason Kenney make some announcements regarding the, the policy shifts and so forth in terms of cleaning up the backlog and ensuring that we attract the qualified immigrants to, to our country. What this means is that unlike in the past where immigrants needed Canada more than we may have needed them, now we need them just as much, if not more, than they need us. These changing trends will make religious accommodations in the workplace even more of an issue for employers. This points to an even greater discussion, ladies and gentlemen, which must take place at the national level. If nations like Canada will increasingly need immigrants, many of whom are religious, to fill positions in its workforce, it calls into question how our country can continue to uphold secularism, where human activities and decisions are separate from religious activities. Can secularism sometimes contradict the values of religious rights and freedoms? Something for you to ponder. Religious accommodations will be a balancing act between the needs of employers to be productive and profitable and the needs of employees to practice his or her religion. Since the Industrial Revolution, economists have seen the workplace as a machine, a rigid and impersonal organization. But if we look at it as a family, the very first institution created by God, perhaps we can find this balance. In my family, my wife has needs, and needs to shop. Prada, <laughs> Gucci, Michael Kors, ladies, you would agree with me. My young adults also have needs. My young son, well, he's 9, 18 now, you know, will shop, 
uh, the latest uh, Xbox and what have you if I allow him to. Am I right? Any, anybody in the audience? Okay, all right, a few of them. You have, you have teenagers. And I have needs. My needs obviously are a little bit more modest, you know, in my busy schedule, Karen. The needs of one party are not more important than the needs of others. Every day our families are finding ways to accommodate each other's needs through compromise. Marriages break down because the needs of one or both parties have not been accommodated. Show me a successful family and I will show you a unit where somehow they have found a way to accommodate each other's needs. The family teaches us to think about other people's needs before our own. It teaches us about the need to respect and accept others no matter how different they may be. It teaches us to respect the individuality of each person. It teaches us the human that human interactions are about giving and taking. And ladies and gentlemen, if you take more than you give, you become a liability instead of an asset. Is KPNG in the room? Yeah. <laughs> Just like in my family and in yours. In order to balance the diverse needs in the workplace, there's going to have to be some compromise, some give and take. On the part of the employer, it's called religious accommodation. On the part of the employees, it's called productivity. Say it with me. Say it with me. Productivity. productivity. I told him I'm going to get you engaged here. I don't want anybody falling asleep on me. <laughs> Employers who want productivity, say it with me, productivity. productivity. Come on. Oh, here, man. I get a hallelujah there. Let's <laughs> have responsibility to be accommodating to people's religion. But employees who want their religion, our religious accommodations, have an equal responsibility to be productive. Employees say productive. 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 Pro productive. productive. Again, Canada is in a unique, I know we're going to use those two P words today. Again, Canada is in a unique position to find solutions to these same questions on religious accommodation and diversity. Since 1867, this confederation with various provinces and territories has had to tackle how to accommodate religious and cultural differences in order to become a whole. What we are facing today is a new confederation. Not a confederation of provinces, but a confederation of cultures. As Quebec brought about the French language and Catholic religion to confederation almost 150 years ago, today there are Iraqis. East Indians and Indonesians bringing new languages and religions to Canada. And just as Canadians had to learn to accommodate linguistic and cultural differences back then and somehow find a way to become one, so it is today, ladies and gentlemen. The biggest enemy to this new confederation will be ignorance. Say it with me. Ignorance. ignorance. Say it with me. Ignorance. ignorance. Come on now. Someone bring up the back. Anybody there in the back? All right, I can hear you. Those back benches should have been brought up front. The solutions we need is not just tolerance, but love and respect. Amen. And oh, glory. And I told you I'm in my pulpit here, so I feel it. Mm, amen. There are people out there who will tell you that this, that as human beings, we are all the same, and that there's some truth to that. But in some very fundamental way, ladies and gentlemen, we are all different, whether individually or culturally. Those differences should be celebrated instead of being as an obstacle. As religions are increasingly accommodated in our workplaces, there will be questions. Even if employers begin to accommodate religion in the workplace, how do we ensure there's no conflict between those that get time off to pray and those that don't? Something for you to think about. This will require much training and education from employers. Societies and workplaces are constantly being shaped by values, whether big or small, as more and more parents value work-life balance. We've seen an increase in flex time. And working from home, as society has grown to value the environment, we've seen more and more employers offering incentives for riding the bus or cycling to work. These are examples where societal values are filtered down to the workplace through accommodation. 
and religion should be no different. Can I get an amen for that? Amen. Mm. In order for this balance to be accomplished, we have to dispel the myth that religion is inherently counterproductive to the needs of the workplace. The practice of the presence of God by Brother Lawrence, Christian classic, on work-faith balance. Brother Lawrence was a 17th century monk working in a French monastery. He was tasked with the most menial job in the whole monastery, peeling potatoes. How many of you worked in McDonald's right now? I've done it. I worked at, let me just give you a little anecdotal here. I worked at Golden Crisp Fish and Chips, peeling potatoes. How many of you like fish and chips? Somebody has to peel those potatoes. <laughs> and it was a good paying job. It helped me to get where I am right now. So you take those small jobs, and as immigrants, we've had to do that, working for three six to five an hour. Yeah, I did that. No, I'm, I'm only, you know, 40 plus. That was a lot of money. That was a lot of money back then. Yes, sir. Thank you. It was this job that discovered the interacting with God while working actually made him more productive, both as a monk and as a potato peeler. Brother Lawrence's superior noted, he had passed his life in perfect liberty and continual joy. He goes on to say when Brother Lawrence fell short of the job, he didn't blame anybody. He simply confessed his fault to God and continued working. How many needs any confession today? How many employers know that you're here? First John 1 9. Karen, you know that. His work faith balance was grounded in the understanding that all work should be done for the love of God. He understood that the only way to work is if God gave him the strength every day. He understood that the only way he could work is if God gave him the strength to work every day. Brother Lawrence encourages us to ask God for his assistance in all of our fears. He teaches us that God is impressed with both the big projects and the small tasks. So we should both do equally both equally well. Brother Lawrence, his superior, sums up his productivity saying, in his business in the kitchen, having to do everything there for the love of God and with prayer upon all occasions for his grace to do his work well. He had found everything easy during the 15 years that he had been employed there. For Brother Lawrence, bringing his faith to the kitchen every day made his work easy. It allowed him to peel potatoes for 15 years while still being a joyful worker. How many of you can say that? Are you happy at your jobs? Yes. yes. Can I get an amen? Amen. You always need more money. It's always show me the money. He was a joyful worker for 15 years. The goal is to find the way for people of faith to be different, yet just as productive as the person working in a cubicle, are in the room next door. The 21st century workplace, where we've seen much greed, dishonesty, and scandals, needs to expand its values to not only include productivity and profitability, but the intangibles like character. Say it with me. Character. character. Honesty. 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 Respect. Respect. These are values that people of faith bring to the table. We should move beyond focusing on the obstacles that come with religious accommodations to focusing on the positive values that people of faith bring to the table. I will close with these words from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And I know that you're all relieved when you heard the word close. He's going to wrap up. Now. <laughs> it's all good. They only gave me 15 minutes, so I'm, I'm, being, yeah, I'm being timely. <laughs> Everyone has the right to freedom of thought and conscience and religion. This right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, either alone or in community with others, and in public or private, to manifest his religious beliefs or belief based on teaching, practice, worship, and observance. As this discussion continues today, May you be guided by these values of love, compassion, and respect for all. God bless you. God bless this great country of ours. Thank you.